Hey guys, I'm Chris Buck, and a very warm welcome to Ferrari Fretworks. And this week, let's take a look at some cool guitars. <laughs> So it's currently that interminable period between Christmas, New Year, and then the world finally feeling like its wheels are getting going again. And as such, some of the grander plans that I have for Friday Fright Works will probably have to wait for at least a few days. But in taking a look back through some of the videos that I posted last year, it occurred to me that not only had I been very fortunate to have some incredibly cool experiences with the band, playing Shepherd's Bush Empire, recording at Abbey Road Studio 2, and of course playing at the Royal Albert Hall, to name but a few. Also had a chance to play some incredibly cool guitars. Not many of them my own, unfortunately, but guitars that undoubtedly left an indelible impression. And as such, guitars I definitely thought were worth another look. Yes, it is a highlight show in essence, but hopefully some cool guitars will kind of make up for that. Now first up, an Epiphone Joe Bonamassa Amos Flying V, although admittedly one that's had a fairly extensive makeover by Hugh Price, a name you'll probably recognise from the restoration of my 62 Strat. Hugh outlined everything that he's done to this guitar, including a refinish with nitrous cellulose lacquer and fitting a set of Pat Number no. 60s pickups on his website. I'll link to that down below if you want to check it out. But the guitar actually belongs to a good mate of mine, Ed, who again you may recognise from Tone Twins TV. And honestly, hand on heart, it is a staggeringly good Good guitar, one of the best I've ever played. There really is something about a Carina V. They're aggressive and direct, but open and woody at the same time. And it's one of the few guitars that you pick up where you can tell exactly what this is going to sound like electrically, just from listening to it acoustically. They are of course a pain in the ass to play sitting down, and everyone and their mother seems to look cooler with the Flying V stood up than I do, so I can't say I'll be playing one live anytime soon, but if this guitar is at all indicative of the 98 or so that were made in 58 and 59, it goes some way to want to explain why an original Carina V will set you back the best part of half a million. Let's take a listen. <laughs>
by comparison, a guitar that won't set you back half a million, won't even set you back £400, I don't think, at the time of writing. That is, of course, the Squire 40th Anniversary Jazzmaster. Now, somehow I'd managed to get as far as 2022 without ever actually having played a Jazzmaster, full stop. That, of course, being rectified in fine fashion with a video that I did last year on a 61 Jazzmaster in three-tone sunburst that I think is actually still for sale, I think I'm right in saying, at ATB Guitars here in the UK. I'll link it down below. Now, despite that being an incredible incredibly cool guitar that sounded absolutely gorgeous, I'm still continually blown away by the 40th Anniversary Squire. It's clear, it's articulate, and has a tune instability well beyond what I ever would have expected of a Jazzmaster. As I've said in the past, I may upgrade the electronics and the pickups at some point, but honestly that's purely for my love of tinkering with things, and not because it needs any improvement. It is a fantastic guitar without any of the caveats of for the money that usually follows whenever you mention a Squire. It's a very, very cool instrument. Next up, a guitar that I'm almost reticent to talk about, to be honest. I don't want to turn too many people onto them, while they are still at a point where, honestly, I feel like they're one of the few genuine bargains left in the vintage guitar world. Of course, talking about the Gibson Melody Maker. Now, introduced in 1959, both in full size and in three-quarter size, the Melody Maker was undoubtedly Gibson's attempt to capitalise on the burgeoning beginner's guitar market. But unlike my 1956 Fender Dewa Sonic, Fender's kind of direct comparison, which is very cool but does kind of feel like a vibey toy, there's none of that with the Melody Maker. This is a serious bit of guitar. Now, in line with Gibson's transition from the Les Paul to the SG, the Melody Maker also changed shape to a double cutaway in late 61. But this example that I played last year, taken from 1960, again at ATB Guitars here in the UK, was a brilliant example of a guitar that, for me at least, felt like a kind of stripped back version of a Les Paul Junior, both in shape and in vibe. Also played a brilliant 1962 model, a guitar guitar in Epsom, whilst on a clinic tour that, again, just reiterated how cool these guitars are. Again, not just for the money, it is a serious bit of guitar. Generally speaking, depending on condition or on age, you're looking at between around £2,000 and £3,000, which, of course, is by no means cheap, but relative for what you would pay for pretty much any other Gibson guitar of a similar vintage, it could be considered a little bit of a steal. Just don't gobble them all up before I get a chance to get one at a half decent price, please. <laughs>
In much the same vein as the Jazzmaster, another Fender guitar that eluded me for so many years is of course the Jaguar. Introduced in 1962 to capitalize on the burgeoning surf rock guitar scene, would actually replace the Jazzmaster as Fender's top of the line instrument, but would be some years until the Jaguar would actually take off, finding favor with the post-punk movement. The likes of Johnny Marr and Thurston Moore, of course, picking them up for pennies in bargain basement guitar shops and giving them a new lease of life. Now, between the Jazzmaster and the Jaguar, I arguably prefer the Jazzmaster for its intuitive pickup switching, but there is really a lot to be said for both the 22nd fret and the shorter scale length, not only making the dusty end that little bit more accessible, but then you've got that jangly, typically Fender offset sound that would come to be typified by the likes of Johnny Marr. It really is a very, very cool guitar. Now, this particular example was a refin from 1964. It was a very cool guitar indeed and actually had me rethinking my instant kind of dislike of matching headstocks on guitar. Sounds a little bit like this. <laughs> Last, but by no means least, a guitar that has undoubtedly cropped up in my dreams once or twice since I had a chance to play it, this 1960 Gibson ES-335. Belongs to a good friend of mine who was kind enough to loan it to me for the video shoot for a card with a black track called I'm Ready. And honestly, it's hard to describe that guitar without disappearing or kind of melting into a gushy puddle of vague superlatives. It really is one of those guitars that just left an incredibly lasting impression. Needless to say, very quickly sent me running back to my own Gibson, or Orville by Gibson 335, trying to upgrade it in one or two ways that would get it a little bit closer to the Holy Grail, but unsurprisingly, still not quite there. As ever, I'm Chris Buck, you're watching Friday Fretworks. I'm going to play you out now rather than try to describe the sound of that guitar anymore. Please subscribe with the bell icon if you haven't already. Happy New Year, and I shall see you next week for not a highlight reel. Cheers, guys. Take care. See you soon.